Oops, there's one more. Once you start to realize that, hello, the life of Christ is playing in your life right now. That's the design for every believer. When Christ said, ye are gods, updating the psalm, which was Psalm 82, verse 6, and it's mistranslated in context, so you have to go back and, and find out the right translation. So I did a Psalm 82 um, playlist channel in uh, Vimeo. When Christ updates that in John 10:34, he's not kidding. See, this is what's not taught in the pulpits. The design is to make you like Christ. So then the mechanism and the structure is the same. That's what answers Satan in the trial. Satan's all busy saying, you know, why, God, did you impose this standard on us? Why, God, is it so hard? Why, God, can't it be something of value in us that counts? And the answer is, God did it better. This is better. This is higher. To be like Christ? The happiest person in the universe? Okay, but he's also the biggest person in the universe and he's also God-man. So how is it there can be other God-men made out of the God-man? Hebrews 12 tells you how. Well, actually, Hebrews 5 through 10. Specifically, 8 through 10. Verse, uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8, going all the way to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17. Those are bookends. Bo both bookends are, are versions of um, rewordings of uh, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. And they're reworded versus the original because that's a style of discourse that's very common in the Bible in order to show you an upgrade, a change, a play on words, an application. Okay? And scholars don't understand that at all. I'm, you know, I'm really um, disappointed in how the so-called theologians don't understand Scripture. You know, like Luke changes the order of the three temptations in Matthew 4. He's doing it for a rhetorical style reason. Because the way he's leading into his next point. Why aren't the scholars covering that? He's playing on Matthew. So then Matthew was first gospel. Duh. And yet some of our so-called brightest scholars think that Mark was the first gospel or that there was a, a Kell. Q-U-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. It's a German word for source. What a bunch of bupkia stupid stupidity. The scholars, honest to God, sometimes they're so stupid. It's like, ah, oh, and you know what they're proposing? They're proposing to cut up the Gospels we actually have to create what they're going to now, in 2015, call the source. They're creating it. They're creating. They are creating another Gospel. And calling that the original. But they're creating it in 2015. It can't be the original. We got the original. And they're so damn dumb. They can't read. They honest to God can't read. Matthew is first. And you know that because Luke surgically wraps his text around Matthew's. He, he tracks Matthew's text. And then what Matthew didn't say, Luke fills in. And what Matthew did say, he wraps and goes to the next point. And then Mark does the same thing, surgically wrapping around Matthew and Luke. So Mark's can only be the third gospel. That's why it's shorter, because you got two gospels that are really long preceding, so Mark doesn't have to add much. God, I could just, I could just, I could just throttle those so-called scholars. But see, today... All people care about is how respectable you are. They don't give a flip about the truth. If you say it and they like you, whatever the hell you say, that'll be called the truth. Because the real truth 
which is really its content, no matter who says it, the real truth nobody cares about. Nobody wants to know or even listen to or even decide or discern. People, you'll notice, they don't actually read the Bible in the original Hebrew and Greek for themselves. Every once in a while, you'll find somebody did, like Theodore Roosevelt did. You read it yourself. Yeah, you need a teacher, but the purpose of having a teacher, just like regular school, is so that you can do it yourself, too. Duh. Now, that is the theme of this. You have to do it yourself. You are a king in training. The king has to do it himself. The king gets to delegate lower things to his servants. But the king is not allowed to be a servant. And that's the killer of this. There are going to be all kinds of objections. Clearly, in Christianity, this fact, which should be absolutely patent, we all know we're supposed to be like Christ. Well, what is Christ? He's ruler. If you're supposed to be like him, you're being groomed to be a ruler. Not on this earth, although you might have some rulership duties, and those will be used for training also. It's primarily after you're dead. You are an heir apparent. You are a crown prince, or we'll say princess, since we have gender down here. I'm crown princess brain out. I hope when I'm dead to be called brain out rather than my real name. Because that reminds me of Ephesians 4.23. That's why I picked the name. Which means that your the Holy Spirit is your brains. That's what that verse basically says. So I want it to be the kingdom of brain out. I don't want to be a king at all. I hate the whole idea of it. Absolutely hate it. Okay, but that's my job. That's your job. Now, since this isn't taught, clearly the whole world hates it. They all have their different objections to the idea. And the, oh, the common commonest one will be, Well, that's being arrogant, brain out. No. Aren't you supposed to be Christ-like? Who would deny that? No one. Okay, what was Christ like? He learned. He lived on the Word. Matthew 4.4. 4. What else was Christ? He's ruler. And the ruler pays for his people. That's why he gets to be ruler. And he's the one who makes the decisions. He's the one who sets the rules. That's why Romans 13 through 15 is there. The strong bear the weaknesses of the weak. That's what rulership means. That's why rulers are supposed to exist. That's the advantage of having a ruler. Somebody who can do the job better than you. So you can go do what you're better at. And the ruler does the ruling. And we, we like to convey status and wealth and honor on our rulers. Because it's a hard job. You have to think for everybody. That's the head, you know, head of the body. 1 Corinthians 13 is about the head. Let me show you something surpassing. Ha ha ha. in 1 Corinthians 12, 31. What's surpassing the body? The head. Who's the head? Christ. So his thinking is called love in 1 Corinthians 13. Okay, well then he does. It's his thinking that you need to learn. If you learn his thinking, then you're a head. And all those who didn't, they're your body. Now, there are a lot of reasons not to want that job. But that's the job that you're slated for. That's the job every Christian is slated for. And n nearly every Christian will forfeit, will abdicate prior to death. So this audio is really about the kinds of objections that are raised, that will be raised in your mind, in the mind of others. 
the primary one is going to be, well, that's being arrogant. No, it's not. If you're born to that job, then you better learn the job, and you're arrogant if you don't. And people pride themselves on how low they are. And what's really cracking me up, for the first time in history that I know of, at least in American history, is that all these people supporting Donald Trump, they're supporting him because he's rich. They really are. The, the the wealth conveys a sort of magical quality to this guy in their eyes. And he's blunt, as rich people often are. Because when you get rich, then you're insulated. And you can afford to say whatever the heck you want. And be blunt if you want. That's what wealth, one of the things wealth does to you. Is it makes you more blunt. You know, you don't pussyfoot around much. Because you are a ruler when you're wealthy. You're ruling your wealth. That's basically what it is. The money that you own owns you. You're a chief slave and your ruler. That's the, the two sides of a coin. Because really your money is ruling you. So because he's wealthy, everybody's saying, Oh, well, see, he knows what he's doing because he's got money. <laughs> I wish... <laughs> There are a whole bunch of really wealthy people out there who don't know a thing. Money does not convey smarts. Okay. Some people get it just because they get it. And a lot of people who are wealthy know that. They're not arrogant about it. They they know that they, oh, I just got this money. I really, I didn't do anything. I have a talent. And, and they rely on others. But see, this is the point. The people want to worship. This is the killer about this. They want to worship Trump. I've never, I've never, I've, I've never even. I, but that's the kind of reaction that as king of your kingdom you're going to get. So you can tell now something of how people look up to, you know, the richer are people everybody loves to hate. And yet this one guy, they're, oh, he must be right. Everything he's doing is going to save us from everything because he's wealthy and successful. Really? I'm not trying to put him down, but what his positions and stuff don't fit the expectation. So that's the number one objection that you're going to end, uh, end up encountering. Here you are being groomed by God. You really are a crown prince or princess. You really are being slated to rule in the eternal state. And it's going to seem totally like you don't fit. You're going to be tempted to think it's arrogant to think of it this way. You're going to be tempted to think that... Um, you can't do it. You're going to be tempted to think that it's too highfalutin. You're going to be tempted to think it's too complicated. You're going to be tempted to think all kinds of things. In the name of humility. But it's not humility. It's a different kind of arrogance. It's the arrogance of priding yourself about being low. And that's the most common arrogance in Christianity. So common and so arrogant that the common lie told about Jesus is that he was poor. He wasn't poor. He was royal family of David. You acquire property over the years. And even though you had all those wars and all the things that happened, yes, his father was a carpenter, but carpenter isn't carpenter the way we think of it today. Okay? It's a much, how do you want to call it? Architect would be a better word. He wasn't poor. You know how you know? Because he and his wife both spoke Greek. Not just Hebrew. Mary's Magnificat is in beautifully metered Greek. And her math ability is just out the wazoo. 
Okay, you had to be taught that. And in those days, they didn't have public schools. So that means they had tutors. Tutors are expensive. I mean, well, you, you can argue all kinds of things about it, but only if you were propertied did you get tutors. Okay? They weren't poor. They just weren't. So, and then on the other side of her family... You have the joining of the houses of um, Judah and um, the house of Aaron. The, the, but it's the Levitical priesthood going through Aaron. In other words, on her, on her, Mary on her, on her, um, I guess it would have to be on her father's side or other relatives, um, was at least tangentially eligible to be in the Aaronic line. Okay, that's what's so ironic about it. She was a daughter of Nathan, who was a daughter of David, a son of David. Okay, and through that line, she ends up being the you know the mother, and that therefore is right, and she's and he's really a descendant of David through Mary alone, because Joseph, of course, was through Solomon, and Joseph didn't you know they didn't have sex. Mary was you know. Parthenogenic pregnancy. All right, done by the Holy Spirit. He just said, "Yes, you're pregnant now," and that's it. You know, nothing sorted about it. Okay, but she is royal family of David. She's born that way. She knows it. She has to come to grips with it her whole life. You're a royal family of God. You have to come to grips with it your whole life. That's not arrogance. It's arrogance if you deny it. It's arrogance if you put it down. And she was not poor, and neither are you. There are many different kinds of wealth. The greatest kind of wealth is Bible doctrine. And that's your legacy from Christ. To get his thinking. And therefore you have, as my pastor liked to put it, a royal mentor. Mentor was actually the name of the teacher of Telemachus. Telemachus was the son of, what's his face, um, Odysseus. The Holy Spirit is your mentor, and that's in John 14. He's your teacher. And he appoints some human teacher to be your teacher and he uses that human teacher to get the information in your head okay and then he makes whatever that teacher says perspicuous to you and it works best in your soul because he matches up your soul with the soul of the teacher that's Ephesians 4.16 okay so the point is that you have a royal father a royal spouse, okay, a royal teacher, and they're all God. So you're arrogant if you don't accept that. You have a royal future as a king being trained by the Holy Spirit. That's in First John, running theme throughout. It's translated born of the Spirit. It really means being sired by the Spirit. Greek verb is genao, and it doesn't mean to be born, it means to be sired. It's talking about the parent. You're being sired by the Spirit. Okay, well, you, you're arrogant if you turn that down. I mean, think about it. What if Prince William said, well, I don't want to be king? Wouldn't we all agree he would be arrogant? Well, if you don't accept that that's who you are, then you're being arrogant. Okay, so the objection will be to refuse this position in Christ. The objection will be to say no to it. And the objection will be very um, attractive. Oh, that's too high. Oh, it's arrogant. Oh, I can't do this. I really shouldn't be this. I shouldn't have this. It's wrong. It's too good for me. Blah, 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 blah. That's one whole category of thousands upon thousands of variant objections that will hit you throughout your life, whether it's internally in your head or in the mouth of somebody else. And that's why Christianity is 
sew in the toilet now. Because they're not accepting that their, their job is royal. No matter how often the Bible says it, they won't listen. They go by respectable people, which is hysterical, rather than by the truth that's in the Bible you can read yourself. John 10, 34. I said, ye are gods. Now, not all pastors are stupid about this. My pastor wasn't. He stressed this. That's why I can talk about it so quickly. This was his number one doctrine. Royal family of God. RFG, he called it. And he spent the entire book of Ephesians teaching about it. Not knowing the meter. And the meter totally, totally reinforces what he said. I was so shocked when I found out about it. It was it just, I, I don't know if I'll ever get over it. He spent 20 years teaching that. He spent eight, no, let's see, from 1985 until 19, seven years, he spent just teaching the book of Ephesians alone. 1985 Ephesians. Okay? Very high level doctrine that you can't find anywhere else. Except maybe under somebody that he taught. Some other pastor, because he trained other pastors too. But, uh, you know, as far as I know, none of them were as good as he was. That that could be untrue, because I haven't heard them all. The point is, you are a royal family of God. Jesus Christ is your husband, you know, as an office. God the Father is your father-in-law. The Holy Spirit is mom. Because that's the role he likes to play. Hebrew ra half, mother hen. That's why I say mom. In Genesis 1 2. He does all the things that mothers do. Jesus is all the things that husbands are to the church. And father is all the things that father in laws are. So that's their nicknames. Okay? That's their roles. It's real easy to tell them apart, too, once you get old enough. Okay, so then your flip side objection is, once you realize, oh, well, I'm not being arrogant. This is, you know, this is my destiny. My, I'm just destined to become like Christ. Everybody knows we're supposed to be Christ-like. Okay, so now you find out what Christ was like, and the principal thing you find that he's like, well, he's God. That's ruler. And he's the Messiah, that's ruler. Stage one of Messiahship, pay for your people. Stage two of Messiahship, rule your people. So you're in the paying phase. And what pays for the people is for the thought pattern to get built in you that they are going to need once you're dead. We're all living off the thought pattern of Christ. He's our copybook, Hupo Gramenoi, in Peter. Keep on imitating him. Philippians 2, what was it? 5 through 10. If you're commanded to imitate him, that means you can. If you can, then it's going to have to be through the Holy Spirit. Because who else knew him? And of course, that's 1 Corinthians 2. So it's a spiritual change that only the Holy Spirit can do. But he can do it, and that's John 14. That's the design. To fulfill John 17, that they be one even as we are one, he said to Father. Yeah, and what's the bride have to be with her husband? Oneness. How are you going to be one with him? It's not. There's no such thing as physical sex with God. It's mental. It's mental intercourse. And that's the most intimate kind anyway. Ask any husband and wife who's been married for 50 years. You can't tell them apart. She finishes his sentences. He finishes her sentences. They're two sides of a coin, those two. They're one in their souls. Oh, that's real oneness. Deeper than any kind of body joining. See, God wants the best for his son. 
So now, you're refusing, as it were, sex with your husband if you don't learn to live on Bible. But if you do, then you have all the same problems that you have with a spouse. The nervousness. The too closeness. The sort of need to run away. The not knowing where you begin and the other person ends. The intensity is so extreme. So that's a second objection. This is so intense. The spiritual life is all inside your head. Because he's building your head. Because that's the future. You are the fruit, not what you do. And the fruit, the fruit bearing, is when you're dead, what's coming out of your head, to your people, in your kingdom, going into their heads. And that's the integration. That's what pleases dad. And they grow. And as you come to understand how true this is, the intensity, the awareness, the reality, the intimacy of it, just like a marriage, is overwhelming. And uh, at the same time, you want it more than anything because of that. And you want to run away from it more than anything because of that. I mean, talk to people who've been married. First couple of years, it's really something. There are a lot of adjustments that the couple has to make. Because they're no longer, it's like, you don't want to live with apart from the person, but damn it, being together, is like, ah, oh, some moments it's like, oh, you just, you just, oh, if you could just run away. The Latins had a, had a cute little phrase about it. Non possum vivere tecum nec sinete. I can't live with you nor without you. And that's how you're going to feel with God, too. It's so real. It's so much more real than the world around you. You're so aware of it, in the latter stages especially, that you just wish you could hide under a rock. I don't know how Abraham lived through it. I don't know how Moses lived through it. I don't know how David lived through it. The intensity is so great. So there's your second objection. The desire to run away. But at the same time, that objection, what's good about it is what's bad about it, as usual. What's good about it, of course, is that's why you want it in the first place. Oh, you finally know him. You're so close. But then the reality of that hits you every once in a while. And it's like, ah! And then here's the third objection, and maybe it isn't as strong for you. And there's a whole classes of objections, okay? The third class of objection is the fact of your relationship to people. My, my pastor talked about this. In the last phase of your spiritual life, which could last 10, 20 years, 2 minutes, so you, you know, it's unpredictable. You're tested on your relationship to God, vertical. And your relationship to life. The hardest part of that test is just knowing the answers. Just surviving the answers. Your relationship to God, you're a king under the king of kings. And the reality of that, and the intensity of that, staring you in the face 24-7 when you wake, when you go to sleep. I'm royal family of God. I'm slated to rule. See, because by the time you get there, your status, your importance to yourself is like, who cares? And then you find out you have this enormous status where every little thing you do is going to hurt or help somebody. You don't know how, but God's going to bless or curse everybody around you based on every little thing you do. And Satan is going to see to it that he holds God's feet to the fire, so to speak, and make sure that happens. So now, oh, gee, well, what if I make the wrong choice of what to eat for breakfast? It's real easy to get anal. That's what I mean by the second category. Now we're going to talk the third category, which is the relationship to life test part. You're going to rule over 
possibly millions upon millions of people. A lot of them people you knew while you were alive down here. I get the distinct impression that this whole kingship thing is generational. My pastor speculated that too, but I can't prove that. It just makes sense. Okay? It makes sense to argue it. There's certain verses about how, you know, the people who you knew here, you don't have to worry about them because, you know, you'll have victory over them. Stuff like that. Um, but whether or not that's true, the fact of the matter is you're going to have millions upon millions of people over whom you're going to rule. And they're going to drool on you for everything. Every every little thing you do and say is going to be important and meaningful to them. That's why I say get your practice now so that it becomes natural. That's how the Queen of England does it. She dresses up for dinner even if nobody's eating dinner with her. So that it'll always be natural and easy to, to live in that formality. Just get your practice now. Just assume that everything you do and say and think is a life or death matter for somebody. You've got to get used to the weight of that. That's your crown. I hate this. I absolutely hate this. That's why I might fail and be at the bottom of heaven's society by the time I'm dead. The idea of ruling over people. Once you really love God, it's the last thing you want to do. You want to be their servant, not their ruler. Because you really are becoming Christ-like. Remember when Christ said, I call you friends? He's their ruler, but he doesn't think of himself that way. He admits it many times. But that's not how he thinks of himself. When he washed their feet, he's their ruler. And he knows it. He's not shy about it. He's not pretending. But it's not the way he wants to relate to them. He wants to relate to them as intimates, as my equals, as my friends. But you can't. When he did the washing of the feet, he had to do that as a kind of ceremony, as a teaching lesson. It was the closest he could come to being equal when he's never going to be equal. And he had to turn it into some kind of teaching lesson that would justify, you know, doing it. This is how you have to think about your brothers and sisters. The very term brothers and sisters implies a kind of equality. But there is no equality. Ever. It hurts. You will always be far above them. They will be looking to you to give them rules, to give them orders, to give them things to do. Their fulfillment lies in obeying you. They need you to be on a pedestal. That makes them happy. Because you went and did what they didn't do. They need, they have this horizontal view of life because they didn't learn Bible. And so they need you to have all the goodies so they can say, see, you learn God, and so now you get the goodies because for all of their being in heaven and sinless, to them everything is still just like it was down here. To them good means having money, having fame, having popularity, being on top, having status. They're going to forever think that way. So you have to get those things. That alleviates their own sense of, what do you want to call it, justice. They had all the goodies down here and you didn't, so now you get the goodies and that's as it should be. 
So they'll look at you and they'll admire you because you're famous, you're popular, you're higher, you got more status, you're wealthy, you have all the goodies that down here people value. You'll have it in eternal state. To you it doesn't mean that stuff. To them it does. And it'll be a relief to them that you have it. And you have to learn how to have it. And for some of us who are training down here, we have to get some of that wealth and fame and popularity and stuff for at least for a short time down here. Just so we can understand the issues. Some of us don't need to go through having it physically. We can just learn about it in principle. I, you know, I can't really say. There's going to be some period in your life where you are well off in a certain, some way. Health or popularity or something. Because this part of the job has got to be, you know, trained. And there's a certain amount of on-the-job training that you got to have. But maybe a lot of it can just be learning the principles of it. Because you're already a ruler of the doctor, which is the greatest form of wealth. You have to rule on the doctrine all day long. But you're going to be ruling people. This is the third class of objection. You're going to be ruling people when you don't want to. And I don't, I, I don't even understand my own objection to this. I hate it with all my heart and soul. I hate the whole idea of people looking up to me. I hate compliments. I hate people telling me how good I am. I hate people telling me I'm smart and wonderful and all this other stuff. I absolutely hate it. It makes me cry. It makes me miserable. It makes me want to run away. And I don't know why. It hurts. I associate compliments with pain. So... Maybe you associate it with something else. Maybe you associate it with all the dreams you had when you were a kid. And you would just love to be king or queen over a whole group of people. Well, then I'm happy for you. Now there are a whole bunch of people out there who are very immature. And to them ruling means they win. And that's another example with Donald Trump. All he cares about is winning. If he doesn't win this election, he wasted his time. He said that time and time and time again. He said it to Barbara Walters. He said it to somebody um, in some interview on the 11th of December. Um, he said it also on December 2nd. There's some article in Breitbart News that's talking about how he's saying it. Oh, if I don't win, then I wasted my time. Is that all this means to you? Now, to some people, that's what rulership means. It's a victory. It's, see, I'm a good person. I win. Well, you ain't going to grow up with that kind of motive. I'm not saying that it should be wholly absent at maturity. You have to have a certain satisfaction of winning. But if that's your primary motive, is just to win, you probably won't make it. Flip side, see what's good about it is what's bad about it. If you don't have the motive to win at all, then you also won't mature winning has to matter and the reason why you know that is that Christ is sitting there on the cross and it's a happiness to him that's in Hebrews 12 too kara unalloyed happiness good translation that my pastor made at that verse um and that verse is talking back to Isaiah 53.11. And Isaiah 53.11's Hebrew says, Yire, he will see, while he's on the cross. Yizba, he will be satisfied, while he's on the cross. Well, one of the satisfactions is, I got here, I won, I made it.
Now, how do you organize those three sets of objections? You can't. They hit you like barbs. They hit you like javelin stabs. They hit you, you know, in an endearing way where you just want to wallow in them. And it and minutes, months can go by before you realize you've been living out an objection and you're way off course in the spiritual life. It happened to David, so it's going to happen to you. Now, how do you learn to simultaneously, how do you learn to love ruling people without being smug about it and without being, what do you want to call it, arrogantly humble about it, arrogantly humble? Oh, I shouldn't rule people. I don't want to rule people. I don't want to have that. And then the other kind of arrogance is to be upset about being important. That's my brand of arrogance. I'm arrogant that way. What right do I have to be upset about being important? I didn't create my importance. So then I don't have a right to be upset about it. It's an office. It's a job. And I'm not 100% sure, but I would guess that that's how you get out of the arrogance in all three styles of objection. It's my job. It's my office. I'm being groomed for this. I was born into the royal family of God. I'm royal family of God. This is what I got to do. And why does that sound appropriate? Because, honey, that's how royal kids are trained. If you're born rich, or you're born royal, or you're born noble, you are drilled and drilled and drilled and drilled every day of your life from the minute you're born. This is who you are. This is your position. This is how you act as a consequence. This is how you think as a consequence. You always have to know your position and be aware of it. Because it's your responsibility. Now that helps balance the you know, headiness of realizing you're high. That helps balance the, what do you want to call it, the horror of knowing you're high. That helps balance the greediness of knowing you're high. That helps balance the desire to run away from being high. See what I'm saying? We all do kind of tend to orient when we're upset. Well, but I got to fix dinner. Or I got to pay my bills. You know, you're crying, you're upset, you're hurt, you're this, you're that, or the other. But there's some business of life issue that brings you back to reality. And actually pulls you out of it. The business of your life. Your royal family of God. This is your job. So hopefully now I finished it. Covered the objections. If something else comes up I guess I'll add something. Peace out.